Hey up, this is Patrick from AI Tutor, the website that can guarantee you NA on A style nail gun mats. For those that are interested, I'm going to leave a link below in the description and I'll explain a bit more about how AI Tutor works at the end of this video. And now we're going to get on with Edexcel A level maths paper 2 from June of 2019. So this is also pure mathematics. I'm just going in cold here, seeing how it goes. Hopefully this turns out well. Cool. So question one says, given that two to the X times four to the Y equals one over two root two, express Y as a function of X. Okay, getting into it. So it looks like everything can be expressed as a power of two here. If I could get two to the power of something on one side and then two to the power of something else on the other side, I could just say that that something is the same as that something else. So this two to the X I'm gonna keep as it is because it's already as a power of two. Four to the X, well four is two squared. So I'm gonna write that down here. Instead of four, I'm just gonna write two squared. I'm allowed to do that, right? And then let's think of all of the powers of two that we have on the right. Two is just two to the one. The square root of two is two to the half. So I'm now just gonna keep kind of cleaning these up and see what I can come up with. So this is again, two to the X, two squared to the Y, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna times these indices. So this is gonna be two to the two Y. This is gonna equal. So on the bottom here, I can just add these powers here because two to the power of A times two to the B is gonna be two to the A plus B. So this is gonna be two to the three over two. Okay, so similar thing here, right? These two twos are times. So this is gonna be the same as two to the X plus two Y. And now this thing, because this is one over all of this, that is the same as two to the minus three over two. This is what I want, isn't it? Two to all of this stuff equals two to all of this stuff. That must mean then that X plus two Y is equal to minus three over two. And now it's just a case of rearranging, right? Because Y is a function of X. So let's take X to the other side. I'm gonna get this, divide by two. That will leave me with minus three over four minus x. Cool, good start. Question two. The speed of a small jet aircraft was measured every five seconds, starting from the time it turned onto a runway until the time when it left the ground. The results are given in a table below with the time in seconds and the speed in meters per. Using all of this information, estimate the length of the runway used by the jet to take off. Okay. So the first thing is this thing's gonna be an estimate. And why is that? Well, it's because we only actually have the speed at these certain five second intervals. So we actually have no idea about how the jet behaves and its speed behaves in between this. So it could do whatever it wants, as long as, you know, at five seconds it has a speed of five and at 10 seconds it has a speed of 10, etc. So that's why it's gonna be an estimate. We don't have all of the data here. So how are we actually gonna do this? We're given time and speed. Now it turns out if I plot speed against time, the area under this graph is going to represent the distance traveled. So the distance this plane travels is going to be the same as the length of the runway, right? So let's just do a super rough sketch here. This does not have to be perfect and it, and it won't be perfect, but it doesn't matter, right? It really doesn't matter. So we're gonna plot time on the horizontal and we're gonna plot speed on the vertical. Now we're given these data points. So just to get an idea of scale, I'm, I'm just going to actually plot these points on and then I can work out what the axes are going to do after. Again, it doesn't need to be. We can kind of see what's going on here. In the first five second interval, it goes up by three, then it goes up by five, then it goes up by eight, by 10 and by 14. So it's kind of going to be going like this, right? Almost exponential or what, or something like that that's not linear. So it's going to start, you know, accelerating slowly and then go quicker. So to represent that, maybe we'll go, okay, let's have a point here. And then if we were to have our 5, 10, 15, 20 and 25 second points here. So it's maybe going to go up a bit and then a bit more, then a bit more even more and then even more doesn't have to be to scale but what we do know is that this thing here is going to be 42 this thing here is going to be 28 18 10 5 and 2 doesn't have to be any prettier than that cool okay so how are we actually going to do this we need to estimate the area under here 
Now, what I would do is use the trapezium rule here, and that's because that is exactly what the trapezium rule is made for. It essentially says, look, I don't care what's going on in between these points, which is perfect for what we have because we don't actually know what's going on. All I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a trapezia just like this. And then the area of all of these trapezia added up is going to equal the area beneath the curve, approximately. So what the trapezium rule says, don't worry too much about remembering this, you should have access to this formula, essentially that this area is going to approximately equal h over 2, where h is going to be the distance between each point on the x-axis. And then y0 plus yn. So these y0, 1, 2, 3 are all the y values. The y0 is going to be the first y value, so 2. And the yn is going to be the last y value, so 42. And then plus 2 times all of the middle ones. If we go straight to the table, it's going to be 5 plus 10 plus 18 plus 28. And then this h is going to be 5. Y0 is 2, because that's the first Y value. Yn is 42. And then plus this bracket from before. So at this point, we are ready to go to our calculator. Just going to go 5 over 2 times by a big bracket, 2 plus 42 plus 2 times another bracket, 5 plus 10 plus 18 plus 28. I'm going to close both of those brackets, and I'm going to get... 415 meters is the approximation for the area. Cool. Given that the jet accelerated smoothly in these 25 seconds, explain whether your answer to part A is an underestimate or an overestimate of the length of the runway used by the jet to take off. Okay, so now it's actually telling us about what's going on in between these points. It said it accelerates smoothly. So what that's going to mean is it's going to nicely go like this. It's not going to jank around or anything. It's going to kind of nicely go up like this. So I'll give you a bit of an idea about what this should look like. Again, this is not going to be pretty, but it doesn't really matter. Essentially, if I kind of smoothly go to link these points up, it's not that smooth, but it doesn't matter. It illustrates my point quite nicely. What's going to happen is... It's always going to go just below these lines. There's no way, if my curve is going this way, that these lines are going to be below this curve. So that must mean that the trapezia are an overestimate of this area here, because the area is always going to be just underneath this. If I was to do this integral from here to here, it's going to be less because of these chunks here of area. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that this thing here is an overestimate because the area of the trapezia is greater than the area under the curve. And I reckon that is enough for question two. Figure 1 shows a sector AOB of a circle with center O, radius 5, and AOB to be 40 degrees. The attempt of a student to find the area of the sector is shown below. Area of the sector equals a half R squared. Okay, I see, I see what they've done here. A half R squared theta, which equals a half times 5 squared times 40, which equals 500. Explain the error made by this student. Okay. So, they said area of sector equals a half R squared theta. Is that always the case though? No. It's only equal to a half r squared theta when theta is measured in radians. So that means that all I have to say is, look, the student used formula for when theta is measured in radians. But look what we have here. We have 40 degrees. So theta is measured in degrees here. But Theta is measured in degrees. So they should have basically done one or two things. They should have converted theta to radians and then used that formula, or just use the formula for degrees. I assume that we're going to have to do the correct thing now. Okay, yeah, write out a correct solution. Okay, so 
why don't, because we already have this radians formula, why don't we just use, why don't we convert this theta into radians and then we can just use that same formula. So theta is actually equal to, so what we do is we take the angle it is and then we're going to times it by pi and divide it by 180 and that's how you convert degrees to radians. So that is going to equal 2 pi by 9 and then 2 pi by 9 radians. So now all we do is we just say, well, look, therefore the area actually equals to a half r squared, which is 5 squared, times by theta. So times by 2 pi by 9. Straight to your calculator to get a half times 5 squared times 2 pi by 9 to get me 25 by 9 pi and then centimeters squared. Question 4. Parametric equations already are made. This exam is going to be evil, isn't it? So the curve C1 with parametric equations x equals 10 cos t and y equals 4 root 2 sine t meets the circle C2 with equation x squared plus y squared equals 66 four distinct points. Given that one of these points, S lies in the fourth quadrant and the Cartesian coordinates of S. Okay, cool. So anything to do with intersections, we know is going to be simultaneous equations. The problem that we have is that one of our equations is parametric and the other is Cartesian. So we're going to need to get them in the form where, you know, they're both kind of in the same form or I can actually get an equation for T or X or Y or something like that. So there'll be a few ways to do this. The way I want to do is I'm going to take this parametric equation and turn it Cartesian. I can then just solve those two Cartesian equations normally. And the reason is because I know it's quite easy to get equations when we have x equals some cos and then y equals some sine into a Cartesian equation. And that is because we can say that cos t is equal to x over 10 and y is equal to, mm, I don't want y, I want sine t show you why in a second. Sine t is equal to y over 4 root 2. Because now I can just say, wait a minute, I know that cos squared plus sine squared equals 1, and this is super useful because now I can get my x's and y's into an equation together, and that's Cartesian. So this is going to mean that x over 10 squared plus y over 4 root 2 squared is going to equal 1. Sweet. So multiply out, see what we get. x squared over 100 plus y squared. How do I square this denominator? Square the 4, 16. Square the root 2, 2. 16 times 2 is 32 equals 1. This is good because look, this is a Cartesian equation. My other one is a Cartesian equation. So do what you want here. So I will take this y squared, get it on its own. So I'm going to get y squared equals 66 minus x squared, straight into the other equation, right? So I'm going to get x squared over 100 plus 66 minus x squared, and just swapping that y squared out for what I've just derived, over 32, equals 1. What am I going to do now? I think a good idea would be to just get these terms as individual fractions, get my x squareds together, get the numbers on the other side, and get x squared from there. So this is going to be x squared over 100, plus 66 over 32 minus x squared over 32 equals 1. Okay, got my x squareds here. Why don't I just bunch these x squareds up together? So all I need to do, if I just go to my calculator and do 1 over 100, so I'm just taking the x squared out of these fractions, just tells me how many x squareds I've got. So I'm going to have 1 over 100 minus 1 over 32, lots of x squared. That is going to give me minus 17 over 800, crazy number, but don't worry too much. I think it's probably going to neaten itself out. I'm then going to take this 66 over 32 to the other side. So that's going to be 1 minus 66 over 32. And that is going to get me minus 17 over 16. Uh, what have I missed out? Hey, I've missed out my x squared, right? This was the x squared number, so I've got that. So all I actually have to do is just divide by all of this. So x squared is going to equal minus 17 over 16 divided by minus 17 over 800. I can see these 17s are going to cancel out nicely. 
So I've got that stored as my answer from last time. Anyway, so I'm just going to do answer divided by minus 17 over 800. And that is, oh, look at that, 50. We'll get two values for x, don't I? I'm going to get x is equal to plus minus the square root of 50. Cool. I'm done. Not quite. All I need to do is get y and then just work out which is the one that I'm after. For x. So instead of just subbing x in to get y, I've actually got a bit of a better equation because I know this. I know that y squared is 66 minus x squared. But I also know that for both values of x, the value of x squared is just 50. So that's actually really easy, isn't it? Because then I can just say the following. Look, y squared equals 66 minus 50, which equals 60. And then straight away I can say, ah, cool. That means that y plus minus the square root of 16. So all of these are going to match up with each other. So I'm going to get a lot of solutions here. I'm going to get x equals positive root 50 and y equals positive 4. I'm going to get x equals negative root 50 and y equals positive 4. I'm going to get x equals positive root 50 and y equals negative 4. And I'm going to get x equals negative root 50 and y equals negative 4. And they are actually kind of, um, they're backed up by what we see here, isn't it? You can see that it's quite symmetrical in that sense. So which is the one that we care about? Well, s, it lies in this fourth quadrant which is the quadrant in which x is positive and y is going to be negative. So that means that my s value is going to be the one where x is negative, x is positive. So these are the two x equals positive ones and y is negative. So it's going to be this one here. So I'm just going to call this my s. Question five. Figure three shows a sketch of the curve with equation y equals the square root of x. Point P lies on the curve. Rectangle shown shaded on figure three has height y and width dx. Calculate this scary looking limit, right? So it's saying the limit as dx, which is the width of this rectangle, goes to zero. So the width is getting smaller and smaller of the sum between x equals four and x equals nine of the square root of x. So times by dx. So look what's happening here. It's two things times together. The square root of x, which is the y coordinate of that rectangle, times dx, which is the width. So this thing in, inside this sum is just the area of the rectangle, right? And then I'm adding up all of these little rectangles between 4 and 9. So this is going to represent an area. But then it says, I'm getting all these rectangles and I'm sending dx to 0. So what that's saying is that the area of this rectangle, the width of this rectangle, is going so, so small, and then I'm going to have all of these little rectangles. It's just going to go to the integral. So it turns out that this limit is exactly the same as the integral between 4 and 9, because as this limit goes to 0, it goes to the exact area underneath this curve. So you just need to know this, right? So I wouldn't call this a trick question, but they're basically just making sure that you know this, this one bit of knowledge. If you don't know it, yeah, you're, you're pretty dumb far on this question. So make sure you do know it. So essentially I can just say this in the exam. I can say that the limit as dx goes to zero of sum from x equals four to x equals nine of the square root of x times dx. That is exactly equal to the integral between nine and four square root of x respect to x. It's that simple. So this is going to be the same as the integral of x to the half. And now I can integrate, right? So I can just say add 1 to the power. So I'm going to get x to the 3 over 2. And then I need to divide by the new power. So dividing by a fraction is just the same as times in by its reciprocal. So in other words, 2 over 3. This is a definite integral. So I'm going to put some square brackets down. 9 and 4 here straight to the calculator. So essentially, I'm going to have to do 2 over 3 times 9 to the 3 over 2, and then minus 2 over 3 times 4 to the 3. That is going to get me 2 over 3 times 9 3 over 2 minus 2 over 3 times 4 to the 3 over 2 is going to equal 38 
over. Question six. Looks like we have some functions on our hands. So figure four shows a sketch of the graph of y equals g of x, where g of x is defined, okay, as a quadratic for values of x less than or equal to two. And then if x is greater than two, it swaps to this linear graph. Find the value of g of g of naught. Okay, here's what I would do. It is going to be so, so useful to do another bracket here. Because then what it says is, okay, I've got this g, and then, you know, the thing I put inside it is this. And then I say, okay, well, what am I putting inside it? It's g of naught. So I'm going to first of all work out g of naught. And then, whatever that is, I'm just going to sub that into the g. So, for naught, naught is less than 2. So I know I'm going to be using this quadratic at the top. So I'm going to say that it is, what, minus 2, because I sub x equals naught in, all squared plus 1. So that's going to be 4 plus 1, which is 4. So that means that g of g of naught is going to be g of 5. And now I say, okay, what's g of 5? So it's that double process kind of going from the right to the left. 5 is greater than 2, so I know I'm now using this straight line. So g of 5 is just going to be 4 times 5, so I'm subbing it in to this 4x minus 7. So 4 times 5 minus 7. Why don't I do it in my head? 4 times 5 is 20. Take away 7, I get 30. Cool. Find all values of x for which g of x is greater than 28. Okay, let's have a look at this graphically. I've got my g of x plotted here. And then if I draw the line y equals 28, something like that, this is my 28. Now I know, right? All of the values that I care about is everything above here, right? So when is it, when is g of x above here? Well, it's all of this stuff here. So everything kind of this way. And it's all of this stuff here. So everything this way. So I need to find out whatever this is. I need to find out whatever this is. And then I can say, right, that, first, that, that one on the left, it's going to be x less than that. And this one on the right, it's going to be x greater than that. How am I going to do that? So you can see that for this one on the right, that's the linear graph. So it's actually quite easy because I say, okay, for the linear one, I just set it equal to 28. I say, when does this line meet 28? And that's it. So I'll add 7 to both sides to get 4x equals 28. Add 7, which is 35. So x is going to equal 35 over 4. So why don't I call this x2? So I can call this x2 and this x1. So then it just makes my work in a bit neater. And then for my x1, I'm going to be solving this quadratic equaling 28, right? So I'm going to say x minus 2 squared plus 1 equals 28. Take the 1 to get x minus 2 squared equals 27. I'm going to square root both sides to get x minus 2 equals plus minus square root of 27. And then I'm going to add that 2. So I'm going to get x equals 2 plus minus the square root of 27. There's two solutions here, right? But I only want one of them. Which one am I going to want? Look at this quadratic, or sh I should actually say kind of section of a quadratic, because obviously it cuts off, doesn't it? So we get this bit going down here, and then if we were to carry this quadratic on, you know, it'd kind of do this, wouldn't it? So that means that the value that we care about is going to be the smaller one, because if this quadratic was to carry on, it would hit 28 again, but higher up. So that would be the 2 plus root 27 meaning that the one that we care about, Rx1, is going to be the 2 minus root 27. So this is going to be 2 minus root 27. So I'm actually good here, because now I can say, okay, this thing is going to be true for x being less than 2 minus root 27, and then separately, x being greater than 35, Cool. Function h is defined by the following. Okay, so it's kind of another quadratic. Then like h has an inverse, but g does not. Okay, that's interesting. h is only defined for x being less than or equal to 2. So if, if we actually think of this, the turning point of h it's going to happen when x equals 2. So h is actually, I'm not going to sketch it properly, but h is going to be only going to be this portion of a quadratic. 
If it was the whole portion, it'd be a different story. But because it's just this, we're good. Because h is a one-to-one -one function, right? One value of x is going to get me one value of y. Think of it as kind of a, a machine, right? I put my x in, I put it through h of x, and I get a y come out. So what the inverse does is it says, here's a value of y, you know, h of x was applied to it. What was the value of x that you put into h to get this value? Um, and when it's one-to-one -one like this, it's super easy. We go, okay, well, go through the inverse, go back to h. Oh, cool. It's as easy as that. But g doesn't. And the reason is because g is many to one. So this here is one to one. And I will explain what many to one looks like here. Imagine I have a many to one function. So I have many x values that when I put them through g, give me the same y value. So think about this. If I now ask the question, here's a y value, it's got through g of x. What, would, what was the x value that you gave me, you know, that you put into g of x? Well, I can't do it now, can I? Because I go through g of x, then I go, oh, wait a minute. It could have been that x value, or it could have been that x value. So I can't actually answer that question, can I? So that is why if a function is one to one, single x value gives a single y value, we can get the inverse. But if the function is many to one, multiple x values give the same y value, like in g of x, then we can't get the inverse. So that's exactly what I'm going to say. I'm just going to say, h of x is a one-to-one -one function, e of x, many to one. all I need to say. Cool. Solve the equation, inverse h of x equals minus a half. Okay, so you could go and get the inverse of h here, but I think we can do something a bit more cheeky. If the inverse of h is minus a half, if I apply the function h of x to both sides of the equation, I would get the following. I would get h of the inverse equals h of minus a half. I just did the same thing to both sides of the equation. I'm allowed to do that. The reason I did it, though, look at this left-hand side. I'm going to almost put it through the function and then put it through the inverse. So in other words, they're going to cancel each other out. That's just going to get me back to x. So I'm going to get x equals h of minus a half, and now I can just sum that in, right? I've not had to work out the inverse, which is saving time, and that is what we like. So straight in, I'm going to say that this is the same as minus a half minus two all squared plus one calculator. So minus a half minus two all squared, add the one on the end, and I get 29 over four. Question seven, a small factory makes bars of soap. On any day, the total cost of the factory Y of making X bars of soap is modeled to be the sum of two separate elements, a fixed cost and a cost that is proportional to the number of bars of soap that are made that day. Write down the general equation linking Y with X for this model. Okay, so Y we are told is the sum of two separate elements. So it's just gonna be something plus something else. So what are those two things? Well, the first thing is a fixed cost, right? It's fixed, it's gonna be constant, so some number. We don't know it yet, but we're probably gonna work it out later. So C, right, it's a constant. A cost that is proportional to the number of bars of soap that are made that day. Well, what's the number of bars of soap? It's X. And if something is proportional to X, we say that it's gonna be equal to K times X, where K is a constant, and it's called a constant of proportionality. It doesn't have to be k, it could be, could be any number that represents a constant, but we usually use k for proportion. So y equals kx plus c, I reckon that's fine there. Cool, so we're now given a load of information that is probably going to get us these values of k and c. So it tells us the bars of soap are sold for £2 each, and when 100 bars of soap are made and sold, the factory makes a profit of 500. And then similarly, when there's 300 bars of soap made and sold, and solved, and sold, the factory makes a loss of 80. Okay, so how are we gonna get these two pieces of information into equations? Because once we do that, two equations, two unknowns, solve them simultaneously, you get your K and your C. So let's think about it, profit. The profit's gonna be how much you get from something 
take away how much it costs you to create or do or make that thing. So in our case, for this 800 bars of soap, we're going to say, okay, well, the, the total amount that we're going to make from 800, so that's going to be 800 times two, because they're sold for two pounds each, and then minus the total costs it makes to, um, the, to the total cost of making these 800. So I'm going to sub in, this is the cost here, the Y, isn't it? So I'm going to sub in X equals 800 here to get 800K plus C. All of that is going to equal 500 because that's my profit. So why don't we clean this up a bit? Why don't we say, okay, 1600 and then minus 800K minus C, because that's inside that bracket, equals 500. Why don't I take this 800K onto the other side and the C as well, make everything positive, and then I'll take that 500 over here. So I'm going to get 1100, 1600 minus 500, equals 800K plus C. I'm going to call this equation one. Do the exact same thing for equation two. So super similar. We're going to say 300 times two, the amount we're going to get from selling 300 bars of soap, minus the amount it costs to make 300 bars of soap, equals, now they don't make a profit, they make a loss. Well, that's kind of mathematically the same as saying I've made a profit of minus 80 pounds. So I can just say that that's minus 80. Similar thing, let's clean it up. So I'm going to get 600 minus 300k minus c equals minus 80. Get the numbers here, the k and the c is here. So 600 add 80 is 680. And then that's going to equal 300k plus and call that equation two. We're now at a good spot. We can see that I've got this plus C at the end of each equation, and I can see that the numbers are generally bigger. I've put 1,000 here, I mean 1,100, and I can see that the numbers are generally bigger on this equation one. So if I was to do equation one, take away equation two, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get 1,100 minus 680 is going to equal 800K, minus the 300k from this and then i'm going to get what plus c here minus c here so what i'm going to get i'm going to get 1100 minus 680 which is 420 is going to equal 800k minus 300k which is going to be 500k and the c's cancel out so k straight up is going to equal 420 over 500 which is going to equal not 0 0.84. So put it into anything you want to get C again. Why don't I put it into equation two here? So I'm going to say that 680 equals 300K, which is 0 0.84 plus C. So that's going to tell me that C is going to equal 680 minus 300 times 0.84 again calculator minus 300 times 0.84 and that's going to get me 428 therefore we're good because y is now going to equal 0.84x that was k plus 428 that was a bit of a graft wasn't it cool with reference to the model interpret the significance of the value of 0.84 in the equation all right that's the thing that's right next to the amount of bars of soap that I make that day, right? So imagine if X goes up by one, my cost is going to go up by 0 0.84 or 84p, right? If, you know, if X goes up by 10, I'm going to have another 10 lots of that 0 0.84 added to my cost. So what that tells us is that for each extra bar of soap I make, you know, add one lot of X, I add 0 0.84. Each, each extra one is going to cost me 0.84, right? Costs 0.84 pounds, or I could even say, you know, 84p here, to produce, produce to make, anything like that. Cool. Assuming that each bar of soap is sold on the day it is made, and the least number, okay, here we go, the least number of bars of soap that must be made on any given day, the factory to make a profit that day. Okay, so this is kind of, in some way, generalizing very similar equations to what we made um, on the, you know, when 800 bars of soap are made and when 300 bars of soap. You can see that at some point, it's going to kind of tip to zero. 
Because when it was 300, we lost money. And when it was 500, we gained money, we made a profit. So if I can instead get that X as my unknown, so I need to think of an equation that says, okay, how much do I need to make that profit or to break even? Then I can work out what X is going to be. So let's have a think about it. How much money am I going to get from selling all of these things? Well, it's going to be two times, let's call it N for the number of bars of soap. So I'm going to get two N and I'm going to want that to be exactly, well, I'm going to, I'm going to want it, I'm going to set it equal to work out how many I need to just break even. So that is going to have to equal the amount it costs me to produce that many. So that's going to be 0.84 N plus 428. I'm now going to solve this for n. So I'm going to take that 0.84 n to the other side. So I'm going to get 2n minus 0.84n, which will be 1.16n. That's going to equal 428. Dividing that now, what am I going to get? I'm going to get 428 divided by 1.16. Now, I've not got a whole number here, and I don't, I don't need to. So, you know, that's because this is just going to be the exact line. So it's going to be 368.9, etc. So what does that mean? That tells me... If I manufacture 368, I'm not going to make a profit. But at some point between 368 and 369, I am. So that means that if I make 369 bars of soap that day, I'm definitely going to turn that profit. Question eight looks a lot smaller than last time. So that is good. Find the value of the sum from R equals four to infinity of 20 times by a half to the r. Okay, okay. So why don't we just write a few terms out here? Let's see what's going on. So if I was four, this is gonna be times a half to the four. I'm then gonna add 20 times a half to the five, add 20 times a half to the six, and we can see what's going on here, right? The only thing that's really changing is this half. And I'm times in by an extra half each time. So that makes this a geometric series. And we can quickly see, we can say, okay, we've got an A, which is our first term. We've got an R, which is our common ratio. And it's a half in this case, you know, the thing that I'm timesing each term by to get the next term. And we actually know what the sum to infinity of a geometric series is. It's gonna be A over one minus R. Now be slightly careful because you can't always use this formula. You can in this case though, Essentially, the modulus of R needs to be less than 1. So R needs to be a number between minus 1 and 1, in which case, in this case, it is because it's a half. So I know that I can use this. So I can just say, look, this is the same as 20 times a half to the 4, all over 1 minus a half. Straight to your calculator, job is a good one. So 20 times by 1 half to the power of 4, all over 1 minus half, 5 over 2. Easy as that. Cool. Show that, okay? Bit of a mad sum this time. Let's have a look at what we have. The sum from 1 to 48 of the log. So it's base 5. I'm not going to write 5 for now, but it is base 5. Doesn't really matter too much. I'll, I'll get it in in the end. We need to show that this thing's equal to 2. Okay. If you ever don't know what's going on, in any kind of sequence or something, just write out a few terms and then I promise you that you'll start seeing things. So I don't know how I'm going to do this yet, but I do know that if I write out a few terms, I'll probably see what's going on. So let's just start, right? N equals one, what am I going to get? I'm going to get log of, and then one plus two is three, divided by one plus one is two, log of three over two, plus, put n equals 2 in, log 4 over 3, plus, keep going, and you can see what's happening, right? Plus dot dot dot. You can see that the top number, this numerator is going up by 1 each time, and the denominator is going up by 1 each time. So we're actually getting all these similar numbers, aren't we? 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, I'd have a 5. What are the last couple of terms going to be? So if n was 47, I would get what? I'd get log 49 over 48. And the last term is going to be log 50 over 49. Cool. So what's this going to be equal to? So when we have minuses 
in things that look like this where you have kind of similar terms a lot of the time a lot of them cancel out really nicely and you're only left with like the first and the end one so i'll show you what i mean there we can use a log law here log of a over b is the same as log of a minus log b in other words log of 3 over 2 is the same as log 3 minus log 2 log of 4 over 3 is the same as log 4 minus log 3 log of 5 over 4 is the same as log 5 minus log 4. Can we see what's going on here? Of course we can. The only terms that are going to be left is look, look what happens. Log 3 cancels with this. Log 4 cancels with this. Log 5 is going to cancel with this over here and it's going to keep going. All of these middle terms are going to cancel out and the only things that are going to be safe is going to be this log 2 because right at the bottom that's the only thing that stays there. And then the largest term, you know, if I was to write out what this last term is going to be, what's it going to be? It's going to be plus log 50 minus log 49. There's no other way to get this 50, and there's no other way to get the 2. Everything else in the middle is going to cancel. So it turns out that this is just going to be log 50 minus log 2. You see what I mean? When you write out the terms, you go, oh, wait a minute, that cancels with that, and it all just works out. Uh, we need to show this is 2, so we're not quite done yet. So we can now undo that law that we used and say that this is actually log of 50 divided by 2, which is log of 25. And at this point, I can say, oh, wait a minute, this was a log to the base 5, wasn't it? You know, the only reason I didn't write it was just for, you know, just for ease. It doesn't matter too much. But remember that it is log 5 that you're working with. And then you say, wait a minute. Well, in words, log to the base 5 of 25 just means the power I need to raise 5 to to get 25. Well, 5 to the 2 is 25, so log to the base 5 of 25 is just 2. A research engineer is testing the effectiveness of the braking system of a car when it is driven in wet conditions. The engineer measures and records the braking distance d meters when the brakes are applied from a speed of v kilometers an hour. Graphs of d against v and log 10 of d against log 10 of v were plotted. There's a lot going on. The results are shown below together with a data point from each graph. Okay, explain how figure 6 would lead the engineer to believe that the braking distance should be modelled by the formula d equals kv to the n, k n constant, with k approximately equal to 0 0.017. Wow, there's a lot to process here. Okay, essentially, what this question is on about is that if I have an exponential relationship, so when I plot these things, it kind of looks like this. If I, instead of just plotting the raw variables, I plot their logs, it's going to reduce it into a linear relationship, into a nice kind of y equals mx plus c. So I'll show you how that happens here. The engineer would believe that this is the case because if the engineer were to take logs of this equation, log base 10, because that's what is plotted in figure 6, I would get log 10 of d equals log 10 of k v to the n. Okay, let's clean this up a bit. Right, one thing, you cannot use the power law to bring n to the front here at this point. The reason is because I don't have this whole argument of the log to the power of n. I only have the v to the power of the n. So what we would first need to do is use the addition law to split those up. I want to get the k in one log and the v to the n in the other, and then I'll be at a point where I can bring that n down in the power law. So the first thing you're always going to want to do is the following. Split them up like that. Now I can do the n, because now the whole argument of the log is to the power of the n. So I, this is, a lot of people make that mistake, so just be, just be super careful about that. So this might look a bit confusing, but if I bring this down here, and I say, okay, What's the graph of a straight line? Well, it's y equals mx plus c, isn't it? So it's y equals, and I'm going to write it this way, and you'll see why. Because figure 6, what's plotted on the vertical axis? Log 10 of d, so that's kind of my y. What's plotted on the horizontal axis? Log 10 of v, so that's my x. Well, what does that mean now? That means that my n must equal my gradient, my m, and my y intercept, my c, must equal my log 10 of k. Perfect. So I've got this linear relationship, which is represented by figure 6, with my log 10 of k being equal to c. C is the y-intercept, isn't it? 
So that means that that must equal, well, we're shown on figure six, that this thing hits the y-axis at minus 1.77. So if I, take e if I take 10 to the power of each side of the equation, I'm going to get 10 equals k equals 10 to the power of minus 1.77. So straight to the calculator, minus 1.77, that should now equal 0 0.1698 dot dot dot, which is approximately equal to 0 0.017. Cool, that's enough for part A. Using the information given in figure 5, okay, so the other graph now, Find a complete equation for the model, giving the value of n to three significant figures. So what is the model? The model is the equation we're given for d, right? It's d equals k v to the n. But we already know the value of k now, so we actually have 0 0.017 times v to the n. So we're almost there, but we're not quite there. It's not complete, is it? And that's because we don't have the value of n. So to make it complete, we get the value of n. So is there any information in figure five that we can use to get that? Well, there is, right? Because we have this data point. We know that when V equals 30, D equals 20. So if I sub all of that straight into here, my only unknown is going to be the N, right? So I'm going to say D is 20. And that's the same as 0 0.017 times by 30 to the N. Let's rearrange this. The n, and then that'll complete my model. So let's divide by that 0 0.017. So I'm going to get 30 to the n, 20 over 0 0.017. To get n on its own, I can take log to the base 30. So log to the base 30 of 20 over 0 0.017, straight to your calculator. I'm going to get the following log to the base 30 of. 20 over 0 0.017, and that is going to get me 2.0787 dot dot dot. Let's see how many significant figures I want. Three. So this is going to be 2.083 significant figures. Fantastic. Part C. Sean is driving this car at 60 kilometers an hour in wet conditions when he notices a large puddle in the road 100 meters ahead. <laughs> okay, must be a pretty big puddle. Um, it takes him 0.8 seconds to react before applying the brakes. Okay, use your formula to find out if Sean will be able to stop before reaching the puddle. So essentially, what's gonna happen? First of all, he goes 0.8 seconds. So we can work out how far, how many of the 100 meters he will have already traveled at the point when he starts braking. So we can work that out. We then say, how much has he got left and is that going to be enough to break in time? And my model is going to tell me that bit. So let's start off with the 0 0.8 seconds. So he's traveling 60 kilometers an hour. Now, we just need to be careful with units because that's in kilometers and hours, but we kind of care about meters, seconds. So 60 kilometers is 60,000 meters. So then what is his speed? How many meters does he travel in a single second? How many seconds are there in an hour? 3,600, meaning that in one second, he's just going to travel 60,000, which is a whole hour, divided by the 3,600, so 60,000, divided by 3,600, in a single second, travels 50 over 3 meters. So in 0 0.8 seconds, 50 over 3 times by 0 0.8, he's going to travel 40 over 3 meters. Okay, so how many meters has he got left? So he starts off with 100 meters. He's already traveled the 40 over 3. So that means that he has 260 over 3, which is about, you know, 86.77 meters to the puddle, right? So now we say, okay, I've got 86.7 meters until I hit this puddle. How, how long do I need, as predicted by the model, to break from 60 kilometers an hour? Well, it tells me right here. So it says D is going to equal K, which we know, 0 0.017, times by V, which is the velocity. So in this case, the velocity is 60 to the power of N. And N is 2.08 to three significant figures. So the model predicts that it would take me 0 0.017 times by 60 to the power 
of 2.08, which is 84.9 meters to three significant figures. Okay, so I'm good. So I start waking when I'm 86.7 meters away, but I only need 84.9 meters to break. So, don't know how much of a big deal it would have been anyway, just going into a puddle, but essentially I'm gonna stop a couple of meters before, aren't I? So I can say, uh, you know, model predicts Sean will need, you know, 84.9 meters to break. Um, but he is 86.7 meters away. Um, therefore, he will stop in time. I reckon that's more than enough to get the marks. Figure 7 shows a sketch of triangle OAB. The point C is such that OC equals 2OA. The point M is the midpoint of AB. The straight line through C and M cuts OB at the point N. Given OA equals A, OB equals B, find CM in terms of A and P. Okay, even I'm confused by that much information. So don't worry. What you need to do, instead of just reading it all and going, what? Read a bit, get the information onto the diagram, cash it in, as it were, and then you can move on to the next bit. And then you can go building up a good picture of what's going on instead of just reading it all at once and just getting this absolute information overload. So let's get the diagram up and let's do the following. Bit by bit, we're going to work on it. So the point C is such that OC equals 2 OA. Okay, so that would mean that O to C is twice as long as O to A. So it kind of just extends this line, doesn't it? So it's like O to A and then double it, so about here. And that is gonna be where C is. And this is gonna be OC, this line all the way up. Point M is the midpoint of AB, so we're getting there now, because we can say, okay, midpoint of AB, that's gonna be M. The straight line through C and M cuts OB at the point N. Okay, so let's draw a straight line through C and M. And then that's gonna carry on, and it's gonna cut OB here. And they're gonna call that point N. So now it's, it's very easy to build it up when we're just taking one bit at a time. OA is A, so this bit here going this way is going to be A. OB is B going this way, so kind of all the way this way. And we want CM in terms of A and B. Okay, so it's all just about like different routes, right? It's about like how do I get from point A to point B? Different way I can go. Obviously, CM is just going straight down here, but we don't know that. So we want to take a different route, okay? So CM, let's think of the way we can do this. The first thing is I can go down to here. So I can do CA. I'm down to A. And then I can just go A to M, right? That's, that's one way of getting there. So let's see if we have any of these. Do we have CA? Well, we actually do. And that is because... We know that this is exactly the same length as A, and it goes in exactly the same kind of line, but in the opposite direction. So CA is actually just going to be minus A. A to M, we don't quite have that yet. However, if I work out A to B, then I could work out A to M, because A to B, think about it. Instead of just going straight here, I could go this way. So... A to O, which is going to be minus A, again, going down here, opposite direction is A, and then O to B, which is just B. So that's AB. So then I say, ah, okay, that's sweet, because I know that AM is just a half AB, isn't it? Because this is the midpoint of AB. So that tells me if I go back to my initial CM, it's going to be the following. CA, which we know to be minus A, Plus AM, which is a half AB, so it's going to be a half, and then AB, which we worked out to be minus A plus B. Let me group my A's and my B's here. So minus A minus a half A is minus 3 over 2A. And then I've just got plus a half B here. So that's CM. Cool. Show that ON equals, ooh, okay, 2 minus 3 over 2 lambda times A plus a half lambda times b. The lambda is a scalar constant, O n. Okay. So I suppose the question becomes, how do I get to O n, right? How do I, or from O to n? I think if I go up here, which is O c, 
and then down here, C to N, I can then start working. So why don't I do that? Why don't I say that O N is equal to O C plus C N. Because now we can start working. O C, we know that, that's 2 A, because that's two times O A. C N. Okay, we, we know what CN is, so CN is just an extension of that, isn't it? It's just a bit further. Now, we don't know how much further, but what we can say is it's going to be some number times by that, you know? Might be 2 times, or 1.2 times, or 3 times it. We don't know, but the fact that it's in exactly the same direction means that it's just some number and it's going to be a positive number because it's going in the same direction, times by the cn. So in other words, lambda, right? Plus lambda times cm, which is this stuff here. So this is going to be minus 3 over 2a plus half b. Now again, group the a's, group the b. So in terms of a, what have I got? I've got 2 here, and then I've got minus 3 over 2 lambda. All of that's a's and then b's i've just got plus a half lambda and b is that the answer two minus two over two lambda i think perfect good stuff okay hence prove that o n to n b is two to one okay that's tough that's tough so let's have a look we're interested in this thing here o n to n b let's think about it we've just worked out what o n is we don't know exactly what it is because we've still got this unknown lambda. Well, let's have a think about this, right? O n is just in the direction of b, isn't it? It's got no a in it. It's not going up like that at all. It's just in the direction of b. So you see here how we've got this a term. I reckon that this a term should just be zero, right? We know that lambda is just going to be some chunk of b because it's on that line ob. In other words, this thing here this 2 minus 3 by 2 lambda, it's got to equal 0. There's no way. There's no way it couldn't, right? Meaning that easy, easy equation here, 3 over 2 lambda is going to be equal 2, times that by 2, 3 lambda is going to be equal 4. The lambda should be 4 over 3, I think. So that's quite nice. Because now I sub that back into this, I get therefore O n is just going to equal, we know the a term's gone, because that's how we set the equation up. A half 4 by 3 times b, which is going to equal, well, 4 divided by 2 is 2, so 2 thirds b. So I think we're good, aren't we? We've got o here, n here, and b here. We're told that this is 2 thirds b. That, mean that, that means that this thing here must be the other third, right? Because b is the whole thing. 1 third b. So that's done it, isn't it? Therefore, O n to n b has got to be 2 to 1 because look, this is double that. That's a third b and that's 2 thirds b. So I reckon we are sorted. Question 11, we are getting through. Figure 8 shows a sketch of the curve c with equation y equals x to the x4. Here we go. Find by firstly taking logarithms the x coordinate of the turning point of c. Okay, so turning points, we differentiate, right? Now, y equals x to the x. Isn't that nicely differentiable? x to the x as it is doesn't just have like a standard derivative. So luckily, they've given us a hint here. Now, I would recommend learning this kind of thing instead. There is a bit of a method that's essentially to do with taking logs and then using implicit differentiation. But at least they told us first to take logs. What they didn't tell us is that the most useful log to take here would be the natural log. And that is because we have a rule for differentiating the natural log. So if we just have some other logs, it's going to be a bit more work to get a nice derivative come out. However, we know that ln of x differentiates to 1 over x. So taking natural logs is just going to be quite nice here. So there's a few ways that this is going to be useful. We're going to get ln y equals ln of x to the x. First useful thing is that I can use the power law to bring this x down in front of this natural log. So what that does is this reduces this thing here on the right hand side to something that I'm actually going to be able to differentiate. 
because I can just use the product tool here, X and LUNX are just pretty normal things that I know how to differentiate. So separating them out has made this a lot easier. The left-hand side is a LUN Y, it's not Y. So I can't just directly differentiate. However, I can use implicit differentiation. So all I really have to do is differentiate as if it's differentiating with respect to Y. So in that case, LUN Y would just go to one over Y. And then I need to times that by dy by dx. So the right-hand side, because I'm differentiating with respect to x, is normal, because it's just x's. So I'm going to use the product rule. So write down the first, differentiate the second, plus differentiate the first, write down the second. So I'm going to write down the x times by the derivative of the ln x, which is 1 over x. Plus differentiate the x, which is 1, times by just ln x. Let's just simplify, clean up a bit. I've got x times 1 over x. x is cancel, 1. Because 1 times ln x is ln x. So we're doing well. So to get dy by dx on its own, all I would have to do is multiply up by y to get y times 1 plus ln x. So this has got two variables in it, but we know what y is. It's x to the x. So if we do that, we're going to have it just in terms of x. Cool. We're not done because we need the turning point. Turning points occur when the derivative dy by dx is equal to zero. In other words, I now need to solve the equation zero is equal to x to the x times one plus ln x. So that almost gives me two kind of options. I get x to the x equals zero or one plus ln x equals zero. Now this first one, x to the x equals zero, we're told that x is greater than zero here. So this thing, I'm not going to be able to get any solutions. It's never going to equal zero. So in other words, one plus ln x is what I need to develop and get my coordinate. So I'm going to take the one to the other side to get ln x equals minus one. And then if I do e to the power of both sides, I'm going to get x equals e to the minus one. Now this is, um, you know, I can put this into my calculator. I'm just going to keep it exact here. You know, put it into my calculator. All it would do is just, you know, make, make me lose accuracy due to rounding. So let's just keep it as e to the minus one. Cool. Part B, show that alpha is between 1.5 and 1.6, where alpha is the x coordinate of the place where y is 2. So it says the point P alpha 2 lies on C. So all I need to do is I say, OK, well, if I was to try and work out alpha, I would basically be trying to work out the value of x when y is equal to 2. In other words, 2, which is the y, equals x to the x. OK, so the way I'd probably like to do this is when we have to show that something lies between an interval, if we can show that on one side of the interval, you know, it's on this side of it, but then on the other side, it's like that, and it's continuous throughout, then we're good. So take this as an example. Imagine I want to find where some function hits the x-axis, and it kind of like goes like this. If at this point, you know, at imagine 1.5 and 1.6, if I can show that when I put 1.5 in, I get a positive number, and when I put 1.6 in, I get a negative number. Then if this function is continuous, as in it doesn't have any breaks, then at some point it's going to have to cross through zero, isn't it? So that's the way I like to do it. So the one thing that I would have to do here is just make this, make this happen in terms of being equal to zero with my equation. But that's not a problem, is it? Because if I just take the two from both sides, I would get x to the x minus two equals zero. So now I say alpha is going to solve this equation. So if I now put 1.5 in, I'm going to get 1.5 to the 1.5 minus 2. That is going to equal negative number, so minus 0.16, da, da, da. And then if I do it with 1.6, I'm going to get the following. I'm going to get a positive number. So this is going to be 0 0.121. It doesn't matter. It just matters that it's positive. So I know that my function is continuous in this interval here. I mean, it's plotted out for me in figure eight as well. So I can say that function is continuous and change of sign in interval, um, hence, you know, alpha lies between, you know, I'd probably 
best write this mathematically. So hence alpha is between 1.5 and 1.6. That's all it is, changes of sign. A possible iteration formula that could be used in an attempt to find alpha is the following. So we have xn plus 1 is equal to 2xn to 1 minus xn. Okay. Using this formula with x1 equals 1.5, find x4 to three decimal places. Okay. So this isn't really a problem. Here's a little trick. Get your calculator. Now, what you can do is you can kind of do this manually and work it out and then work out the value of x1 and then note it down, put it back into the value of x2. However, I'm going to show you a little trick. If we just write, so we our x1, we, we know is 1.5. So just write literally about 1.5 on your calculator and then press equals. What this is going to do is this is going to store the ants, the answer, the ANS in your calculator as 1.5. So this is really useful because what I'm now going to do is instead of writing out this formula here, like with a 1.5 in, I'm just going to do it with an ants instead. So it's 2xn, so I'm going to write 2 times ants to the power of 1 minus ants. And the reason is, I can just smash the equals button because when I press enter here, I get the value of x1, but then it stores the value of x1 as my ants. And then I'm going to feed that into x2 using that ant. So in other words, I'm not going to need to press anything in my calculator now, apart from this equals button. Watch this. Press equals once, I get my value of x2. And that is going to be 1.632, etc. Press it again, get the value of x3, 1.466, dot, dot, dot. Press it again, and I get the value of x4. Can you see how easy this is once I've set this up? And then this is also going to be super useful. I can just click this equals loads and get the long-term behavior without having to go back and put extra numbers in or anything like that. So x4 to three decimal places is going to be 1.673. That's it. So describe the long-term behavior. This is super useful. I've got my calculator here already. So why don't we just see what happens, right? Let's press equals loads. Just keep pressing it, see what happens. You see it's jumping about quite a lot. Just honestly, if it keeps changing, you can keep going. Honestly, here we go. Look at this. I've now got to a point, I've pressed it quite a few times, and I'm now at a point where it's just oscillating, isn't it? It's going between two and one. And I can do this forever, and it's just gonna keep jumping back between two and one. So, all I can say is the following, you know, it goes two, one, two, one, two, one. So what does this mean? Well, this means it's periodic, doesn't it? It's repeating itself. So I will say this is periodic. And I can even say, you know, jumps between one and two. When something's periodic, to describe it fully, it's usually quite nice to describe like the period of it, right? Like sine is periodic and the period of it is 360 degrees or two pi radian. So the period of this thing is gonna be two, isn't it? So every two, it goes back to the same. So periodic with period, Question 12, prove that cos of three theta over sine theta or sine of three theta over cos theta is equivalent to two cot of two theta. Okay, so the first thing I'm thinking is that we've got three thetas and we've got thetas here, but then the end result is gonna be two thetas. So we're gonna have to do something in terms of multiple angles here, either you know getting the three, breaking it down to a two and a one, or doing something else to in some way get a multiple angle formula. So you could think to split the cos of three theta into a cos of two theta plus theta, and the same with the sine theta, so that would be sine of two theta plus theta. Now I'm not saying that's gonna be wrong, however I can see that getting slightly messy. And the reason I'm hesitant is because there's one thing that I think would be quite nice here. Generally, when we have multiple trig fractions, a lot of the time something nice is gonna happen if we put it into one. So if we get a common denominator here by cross multiplying, I think something nice is gonna come out of it. So if I was to get sine theta cos theta common on the bottom, so the first fraction I'm gonna to need to times top and bottom by cos theta, and that's gonna get me cos of three theta cos theta. And then that's going to be over my sine theta cos theta. And then the same with the second one, I'm going to times top and bottom by sine theta to get that common denominator. So that's going to be plus sine three theta 
sine theta. So this is quite nice at this point. And the reason is because I recognize kind of both top and bottom here. So the top, let's compare this to the multiple angle formula for cos. So multiple angle formula for cos, I'll just quickly remind you of it, is going to be cos of a plus minus b is the same as cos a cos b minus plus sine a sine b. So that minus plus there is basically just saying if I have the top one here, which is a plus, that means that that corresponds with a negative one here, the top one, and same with the bottom one. So if we compare this to what we have here, <clears throat> we've got cos 3 theta, cos theta, and then we've got a plus here. So the thing we're interested in is kind of this bottom one. So if I just remove top ones here, I get the thing that I'm interested in. I get cos of a minus b <clears throat> is the same as cos a cos b plus sine a sine b. We have that right hand side here, don't we? Because if 3 theta was equal to a and theta was equal to b, this would literally be cos of 3 theta cos theta plus sine of 3 theta sine theta. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the top is just equal to cos of a, which we're setting as 3 theta, minus b, which we're setting as theta. So that's pretty nice. We also know that the double angle formula for sine, I'll just remind you of it quickly here, it comes from the multiple angle formula for sine. I'm not going to derive it now, but it's something that you should know how to do. So that is basically going to be the same as sine 2 theta, we know is 2 sine theta. Okay, so if we have sine theta cos theta, if I divide both sides of this by 2, I'm going to get that, and that's going to be a half sine of 2 theta. I think we're on the home straight now. So this here is going to be cos of 2 theta on top, divided by a half sine of 2 theta. Okay, if I have this fraction on the bottom, what I can do is I can times both top and bottom of this fraction by 2, going to get rid of the fraction down here and the top's going to be multiplied by 2. So this is the same as 2 cos of 2 theta over sine 2 theta. And we know that cos over sine is the same as cot, because cot is 1 over tan and tan is sine over cos, which just gives us our answer. This is the same as 2 cot 2 theta. Sweet. Hence, solve for theta between 90 and 180 degrees the equation, and then everything we had on the left-hand side from part A, and all of that to be equal to 4. Okay, so what does hence mean? Hence means use what we've just done. So clearly the way that we can do this, right, if we know that everything on the left-hand side is just equal to 2 cot 2 theta, which is exactly what we just showed, then this equation is actually just boiled down to 2 cot of 2 theta equals 4, which is a lot simpler. Okay, so do the obvious thing first, divide by 2. So dividing both sides by 2, I get cot of 2 theta equals 2. Now, <clears throat> it's usually a good idea to kind of go back to like the, the base trig functions. And by that, I mean cos, sine, tan. Cot is 1 over tan. So let's sub that in here. So 1 over tan 2 theta is equal to 2. I'm going to basically flip both sides. So I'm going to get tan of 2 theta <clears throat> equals a half. And now I'm at a pretty good spot. So I can now kind of get my calculator out, get some solutions, work out which ones I want, stuff like that. I want to kind of offer a quick word of warning, and that is the following. If my range at the moment is 90 and 180 degrees, I want you to be careful because yes, theta is between 90 and 180. However, 2 theta is not, is it? If I double this whole range, because I'm doubling theta, I'm going to get 2 theta to be equal to, well, between 180 and 360. Now, this is really important. It's a very common mistake to see this range here and then say, okay, 2 theta, you know, I'm looking for values between 90 and 180. You then end up dividing by 2 to get theta on its own, and stuff goes wrong, right? So make sure that you want to solve the trig equation as if 2 theta is your new variable, you know, sort out all of the range and stuff, and then right at the end, when you, once you've got all your solutions, then divide down, and it's all going to fit in nicely to the initial range. I'll show you what I mean by that. 
Let's sketch the tang graph to get a bit of an idea of what's going on. Super rough sketch doesn't need to be beautiful. So it kind of goes like this, it goes in these chunks. This is going to be 90. And then one more here. This is going to take me to 270. It's going to hit at 180 as well. So it hits in multiples of 180. So if I'm stopping at 360, essentially I'm going to get one more half chunk like that, and then it's going to stop. So my range is basically going to be anything between this red line here, which is 360, and this red line here, which is 180. So we can actually see what our solution is going to be because if I was to draw a line right here, yes, it hits here, but that's not in my range. The one that I care about is the intersection between 180 and 360. Perfect. So at this point, we're ready to go to our calculator because we go, okay, we know we're looking for one solution. We know which one it's going to be. So I can then confidently say, okay, all of the solutions for two theta is just this one. I know that I've not missed any out. So if I was to now go to my calculator, I'm going to make sure that it is in degrees. So I'm going to go to the angle unit, set that to degrees. I'm then going to do the inverse tan of a half. And what that's going to do, <clears throat> So this thing here is going to get me twenty six point five dot 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 degrees. Is this my answer? Well, it's not. Let's look to the graph and see what this represents. My calculator is always going to give me the one kind of here. So it's giving me this, isn't it? If this thing here is my twenty six, I actually want the next solution. So in terms of tan, all we have to do to jump is we add 180 degrees. So I'm going to go to my calculator. I've got this 26.565, etc. saved in my answer. So all I need to do is add 180 to this, and that's going to get me 206. So I'm going to get my two theta solution is 206.5. I'm not even going to round that fully yet, because I'm now going to divide by the two to get my theta. So again, answer divided by two. I don't need to kind of carry any rounding errors. And that is going to get me theta. And now at this point, I can round. So it asks for one decimal place. So it's one decimal place. It's going to be 103.3 degrees. 13, we're getting through. Right. A manufacturer produces a storage tank. The tank is modeled in the shape of a hollow circular cylinder, closed at one end with a hemispherical shell at the other end, as shown in figure nine. Okay. The walls of the tank will seem to have negligible thickness, which is nice. The cylinder has radius r meters and a height h meters, and the hemisphere has radius r meters. Okay, so they're just explaining the diagram here. So it looks like a lot of words, but it's essentially just what we see in that picture. The volume of the tank is six meters cubed. Show that according to the model, the surface area of the tank is given by this. Okay, so this is a very common type of question. Essentially, it's quite a it's quite a useful problem to solve. It's basically saying, look. This manufacturer, this business is producing this tank. And it's obviously this tank is used for storing stuff. So the thing that I care about in this tank is the volume, right? More volume, the more stuff I can store in this tank. So it would be really interesting if I could get a solid amount of volume, a good amount of volume, but using as, you know, the minimal amount of materials possible. So imagine if I could keep the same volume, but actually reduce the surface area because then I'm using less materials, but for the same result, for the same, you know, the same amount of value is brought because I can keep this six meters cubed, but use, I don't know, 50% less materials or something like that. So it's a very interesting problem to solve and we can use calculus or differentiation to solve it. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna start off by getting the surface area because this is actually gonna be the thing that we're gonna eventually wanna minimize. So looking at this diagram, the surface area is made up of this bottom circle here, and then this curved surface area up here of the cylinder, and then the top of this sphere here, this, this hemisphere. Okay, so S, surface area, is going to equal the area of the circle at the bottom, that's the easy bit, by R squared, plus the area of this bit going up, so it's gonna be the circumference of this circle, and then kind of times by this height, kind of, span this area out. So that's going to be 2 pi r for the circumference times by h plus the top bit. 
People don't usually remember the surface area of spheres, but they've given it us. So the surface area of a sphere, careful, a full sphere, is 4 pi r squared, but we've got half a sphere. So just divide it by 2 in pi r. Cool, okay, um, I can see I've got a couple of pi r squared terms, so let's just quickly get those together. So I've got 3 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h. Okay, this would be fine here if this was just in terms of r, but it's not, is it? I've got two variables here, I've got r and h, so it's a bit more difficult to, you know, kind of just do stuff on this s, differentiate with respect to r, all of that stuff. It would be really useful if I could express s just as a function of r. So, are there any other pieces of information that I can use here to get an equation that relates h and r? Well, th there is one, isn't there? Because we're told that the volume of the tank is 6, and we've not yet cashed that in. So, if I work out what the volume of the tank should be, in terms of r and h, set it equal to 6, I'll then have an equation that I can kind of relate h and r with. So, similar thing to what we just did, we say, this thing, you know, the volume is made up of what? Well, it's going to be the cylinder and the hemisphere on top. So, for this cylinder, I'm going to take the area of the circle at the bottom, times it up by that h, and that just kind of spans that whole volume. So, it's going to be pi r squared times h plus, and then it tells us that a sphere of radius r has volume 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So I'm going to need to half that because I got half a sphere. So it's going to be 2 over 3 pi r cubed. Okay, all of this must be equal to 6 because we're told that. So we want h from this equation because then when we get h on its own, it's just going to be h in terms of r, sub it back into the surface area, and we're laughing. So let's take this 2 thirds pi r cubed onto the right hand side to get us pi r squared h equals. 6 minus 2 thirds pi r cubed, almost there. Divide by that pi r squared, what we're going to get? h equals 6 over pi r squared. Let's have a look at this term here, because I think some cancellations are going to happen. I've got a 2 thirds, and there's no other number that I'm dividing by, so that'll stay like that. I've got a pi here, which is going to cancel out with a pi here, so they're gone. And then I've got an r cubed, but I'm dividing by r squared, so I'll just have one r left, so two thirds r. Good, we're getting there. There's a lot of algebra, so just, you know, be really careful. The good thing about this question is that they give you the final answer, so if you make any small mistakes, you'll be able to tell by the time you're there, and then just have a quick look through your work, and you should be able to. Let's sub this straight back into s, giving us s equals 3 pi r squared plus 2 pi r, and then instead of h, I've got this. 6 over pi r squared minus 2 over 3r. Woo, we're getting there. Right, 3 pi r squared. Let's multiply this bracket out and see what we get. I'm just going to, I'm going to write the whole thing and then we'll start cancelling just to make sure we really keep track of everything. So we're going to get 6 times 2 pi r over pi r squared minus 2 thirds r times 2 pi r. So this should be okay at this point. So let's have a look. 3 pi r squared, keep you as you are. 6 times by 2 pi r. So the 6 times 2 is going to get us a 12. I've got a pi here that's going to straight up cancel with that pi. And then I've got an r and an r squared here. One of the r's is going to cancel and I'll just be left with 1 r on the bottom. So this is quite nice, 12 over r. Let's think here, what are the numbers? So the numbers, I've got a 2 over 3 and then a 2. So that's going to get me a 4 over 3. I've still got that pi, that doesn't cancel. And then I've got an r times r, so that's going to be r squared. Okay, we're getting there. I've got a 12 over r. And then in terms of the numbers in front of the pi r squared, you can see that I've got 3 pi r squared minus 4 over 3 pi r squared. But let's just get that number. If I just do 3 minus 4 over 3 here, I'm going to get 5 over 3. So in terms of the amount of pi r squareds I have, I have 5 over 3. Quickly check with the show that to see if that's what they have, and it is. So we're laughing. Cool. Part B. So, yeah, okay. So the manufacturer needs to minimize the surface area of the tank, which makes sense, right? Save the materials. Use calculus to find the radius of the tank for which this surface area is a minimum. So this is what I expected would happen. 
we essentially have s, which I'm going to rewrite quickly to a, to a nice differentiable form by just swapping this term out here. So this is going to be a 12 r to the minus 1. 1 over r is r to the minus 1. And then plus 5 by 3 pi r squared. So we know what s is. And now this is actually just a classic differentiation question. It's basically just saying, look, find the minimum. So what do we do to do that? We differentiate, we set it equal to zero and all of that stuff. So ds by dr is going to equal, bring the power to the front and take one from the power. So I'm going to get minus 12 r to the minus two plus, and then this two is coming to the front. So that's going to be 10 over three instead of five over three. I take one from the power, it's r to the one, which is just r. I want to set this thing equal to zero. This equals zero. And now let's get r. So this is a negative, so I'm going to take it onto the right. So I'm going to get 10 by 3 pi r equals 12. And then r to the minus 2 is actually just 1 over r squared. So this is actually just divided by r squared. I need all my r's together, don't I? At the moment, they're split up. If I multiply by r squared, I'm going to get 10 by 3 pi r cubed. r times r squared is r cubed equals 12. Let's get rid of these numbers. So I'm going to get pi r cubed. If I times up by 3, 12 times 3, divide by that 10, I am then going to just divide by this pi here. So I'm going to get r cubed equals 12 times 3 is 36, divided by and then 10 pi. So that would mean that r is just going to be equal to the cube root of 36 over n pi straight to the calculator again. 36 divided by 10 pi in the cube root is going to give me 1.046 dot dot dot. Let's go three sig fig here. So it's about 1.05. So R is just 1.05. It doesn't need a unit because in the question we're told, you know, the cylinder has radius R meters. So it's already told us that unit there. But, you know, if we were to just say, you know, therefore the radius is, so if they're just asking for the radius, then it's going to be 1.05 meters. But either way, you'd be good there. Woo, we're almost there. And I think we've just got the easy bit left now. So it says calculate the minimum surface area of the tank, giving your answer to the nearest integer. We've done the hard work, haven't we? We've already done all the derivatives, set it equal to zero, all of that stuff. So now we just cash it in. We just say, We've done all the hard work to get the radius at which this minimum occurs. So to find the minimum, all we do is we just sub that radius back in, right? So we know what S is in terms of R. So we just sub this value of R in. So S is 12 over R. So 12 over 1.5 plus 5 over 3 times pi R squared. So 1.05 squared. So just a couple of easy math. So I've already got the answer to the last part of the question in my calculator stored as the ants, the answer. So instead of writing 1.05, I'm going to use that ants because then that's going to minimize the chance of rounding errors, isn't it? Because I'm actually using the unrounded version from my calculator. It's a bit less work as well. So 12 over ants plus 5 over 3 pi times ants squared. And that is going to get me 17 point two dot 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 let's just see kind of if they want to round it in the question and it says calculate the minimum surface area of the tank giving your answers of the minimum perfect so the minimum surface area so the min surface area is going to equal to the nearest integer 17 meters squared oh Ooh, looks like they're coming out all guns blazing for the last question okay so it says use the substitution u equals four minus the square root of h show that the integral of 1 over 4 minus root h is all of this stuff here. You can see we've got some logs in it, and then there's kind of another term here and some con. Okay, so essentially, integration by substitution. There's a couple of steps to the process, right? We have a substitution, and our goal is to take everything in this current integral we have, which is in terms of h, and turn it in to being in terms of u. So that means all of the stuff inside it that we need to integrate, but it also means the dh needs to turn into a du as well. 
If this was a definite integral, it would also mean that the limits would have to turn into u values, but luckily this isn't a definite integral, so we don't have to worry about that. So what I like to do is always start with changing the dh into a du. So the way we're gonna do that is we're just gonna differentiate the substitution. So du by dh, this term is going to go because it's just a constant. So we're just left with this. I'm going to bring this power to the front. So we're going to have minus a half h to the minus a half. Okay, so essentially then what we do is we're going to want to rearrange this for dh, but I'm just going to see if I can clean this up at all. So h to the minus a half is going to be the same as one over h to the half at the bottom. So I'm going to have this two from this, and then I'm going to have h to the half here. But h to the half is just the square root of h, right? So I get 1 over 2 root h. So this is quite nice. Um, what I'm going to want to do is get this in terms of u, but to have it in root h is a good place to do that. So essentially, if u is equal to 4 minus root h, what's root h in terms of u? Because remember, get rid of your h's, get everything in terms of u. So I'm going to add root h to both sides. And I am going to take u from both sides to get root h equals 4 minus u. Okay, what I'm now going to do is substitute this into what I have for du by dh. So du by dh is now going to equal minus 1 over 2 times 4 minus u. Okay, rearrange this for dh. So we can kind of treat du by dh as a fraction. It's not exactly like a fraction, but for all our intents and purposes, we can treat it like one in terms of this rearrangement. So essentially, if I just multiply up by dh, I'm going to get dh, and then I'm going to multiply by this 2 4 minus u on this side, which will come with the du, and I'm also going to get this minus to the other side. So I'm going to get that. Okay. Now I'm at a point where I can just substitute this straight into the integral, which is nice. So this then gives me dh, which is just minus 2, 4 minus u du, over, and then what do we have in the integral? We have 4 minus root h. Well, that's just u, isn't it? So this is u. We've now successfully converted everything from h's to u's. Sweet. Let's tidy up a bit and then see if this is something that's easy to integrate. So I want to just times this minus 2 out, it's annoying me. So I'm going to get minus 2 times 4, which is minus 8, and then plus 2u, those minuses cancel out, which is nice, all over u. So generally with integrals, we have a couple of terms on the top of a fraction and then one on the bottom, usually easier, not, not all the time, but usually, to just individually write these as fractions. In other words, minus 8 over u, plus 2u over u, because then it's just going to make these terms nice and small and integrable more than anything. So I'm going to get minus 8 over u, and then plus 2u over u, the u's are going to cancel, aren't they? So this is just going to be plus 2. We're getting there. I can integrate this now. So to integrate this, this is essentially minus 8 times by 1 over u. To integrate 1 over u, that just goes to ln u, the natural log of u. So ln, and it's going to be the modulus of u there. Yeah. And then plus 2u, that's a simple one. And then remember, it's an indefinite integral, so we always need the plus c. Do not forget it, please. Okay, we've integrated. The last thing to do is get it back in terms of h. So, sub it straight in, nothing too confusing here. So the u is the same as 4 minus the square root of h plus 2u, again, 4 minus the square root of h and the plus c. Bit of simplifying it looks like we can do here. So what do I get? I get a, uh, let's put this here at the front again. Can't do much to this at this point. Plus eight, which is the two times four, minus two root h, and then plus c. So let's have a bit of a look at what's going on here. That's not exactly what they have, is it? But this is fine. Because look, we've got this c, which is essentially an arbitrary constant, right? But we've got this other constant here. So what I can actually do is I can merge these constants together because if c is an arbitrary constant, then c plus 8 is just going to be another arbitrary constant. In other words, I could say, look, why don't we just let k equal 8 plus c? Because then what's going to happen is I'm going to have this thing is equal to minus 8 ln 
for 4 minus root h minus 2 root h and then plus k. So k, you know, is just another arbitrary constant. I can work it out later on and everything, but there's no point in keeping a constant and then a plus c. I can just put them together. And that is what they've got. Ooh, part b. A team of scientists is studying a species, slow-growing tree. The rate of change in the height of a tree in this species is modeled by the differential equation and then dh by dt. So we've got t to the 0.25 and then this 4 minus root h, which look, it's very similar to what's in part a. So that's definitely going to come in handy at some point, all over 20. h is the height and t is the time measured in years, okay, after the tree is planted. So it says, find according to the model the range in heights of trees in this species. Okay, so that's interesting. You might be tempted to just straight in all guns blaze in, you know, solve this differential equation. I'd say just, just hold off a bit. And the reason is this, this is, this gives us two marks here. And then the next part gives us seven marks. So where do you think, you know, the full on solving of the differential equation is going to be? It's going to be in the next part, isn't it? So... What can we do that's kind of clever? The range in heights of trees. Well, the first thing about a height is it's got to be positive, hasn't it? You know, we know that a height can't be negative. A tree can't be minus four meters tall. So we know it's going to be greater than zero. So really, we just need to kind of find the max value it can be. And then we're good. We've got the zero and the max value. So I think we could actually do something pretty nice here. We've already got the derivative. And remember, Max values, how do we get those? We use derivatives, you know? We get derivatives and set them equal to zero. So why don't I do the following? Why don't I set dh by dt to be equal to zero? And then look, that means that this fraction is equal to zero. For a fraction equal to zero, I need the top to be equal to zero. So, in other words, that means that t to the 0.25 times by four minus root h has got to be equal to zero. Okay, so I don't really care about this, you know, t equals zero solution here. And that's just going to be at the start. So that um, that's going to be the minimum height essentially, isn't it? But this four minus root h to be equal to zero, that's going to get me the max, isn't it? So essentially, this is going to be the square root of h equals four. So h is going to be four squared, just equals 16. So I think that the range of values here is just going to be h. It's going to have to be greater than or equal to 0 because it represents a height and less than or equal to 16. Cheeky one there. Cheeky one. Not, not very normal, that question. So, you know, a bit of thought required for that one, definitely. One of these trees is one meter high when it's first planted. Okay, so this is classic. This is going to be the piece of information that gets us a constant According to the model, calculate the time this tree would take to reach a height of 12 meters, giving your answer to 3 sig fig. Okay, so this is the point where we go straight in. We're going to need to solve this differential equation to get h as a function of t. And then once we've done all of that, the constant, all of that stuff, we then just go, okay, stick in h equals 12 and get the time. So how are we going to solve this differential equation? So the method we use is called separation of variables. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. We need to separate the variable. All of the variables for, you know, all of one variable on one side and separated from it, all of the other one on the other side. So I've got T's and H's. What I'm gonna need to do is I'm gonna need to get all of my H's on one side with the DH, all of my T's on the other with the DT, and then I can separately integrate these things. So this DH on the top here, means that I'm going to want my dh on the left-hand side. I'm going to want to times up by dt here. So I'll do this very slowly, step by step, to really show you what's going on, because I know differential equations can be a bit mad. So times dt, and then I've got this 20 here. What I can now do is I want to bring these h's down with the dh. So the term that is relevant here is the 4 minus root h. I can't just divide by the root h, because it's kind of attached in with this 4. I'm going to divide both sides by 4 minus root h to get dh over 4 minus root h is equal t to the 0.25 over 20 t. And I'm pretty sweet at this point. I've got all my h's on one side with a dh. 
and all my T's on the other side with a DT, meaning that I can actually just integrate both of these sides. And I've already got, you know, the DH that tells me that I'm integrating this with respect to H and the same with the T. So before we jump in, do we recognize anything? Super, super classic question, right? Classic A-level maths. It's going to say part A, do some kind of integral. And then part B, that integral is just going to pop his head up, especially in a differential equation. They've not said, you know, use part A or anything. So they're relying on you to see that. But look, the integral on the left is exactly what we did on the right. So without even thinking, my left-hand side, I know that this is exactly equal to minus eight to learn. I'm just copying the question here. There's, there's nothing else I need to do. So interestingly, if I failed on part A, didn't get the answer, I'd still be able to have a go at part B here because they're giving us the answer for part A. So, you know, don't, don't be disheartened if you, you know, if you don't do the substitution, you can still grab the marks in the later parts of the question. So we get minus two root H plus K, just copying, nothing else. Okay, and I need to integrate this thing here. So, um, I've got this 1 over 20. Bring that out of the interval before we think about anything. Now, I need this is just like kind of a polynomial. So, I need to just add 1 to the power of t. So, that's going to be t to the 1.25. And then divided by 1.25. So, that 20 and the 1.25, I'm sure, is going to come up with something nice here. Um, in terms of constants, so... Essentially, if I was to, you know, do this integral, I get this constant from this side, you know, cut some constant of integration, and then I would technically get some other constant of integration from this side. But just how we did in part A, where we said, well, look, if I have an arbitrary constant and kind of add it to some other constant or another arbitrary constant, that's just another arbitrary constant. So if I was to say, you know, add C to this, what I could then do, just as I did before, I could say, well, look, you know, if I take C from both sides, I'd get this K minus C, but I could just call that some other constant of integration, couldn't I? And any letter I want. So I'm even going to be really cheeky and just say, you know what? I'll just keep it as K. So K might not necessarily be the same K as in part A, but it doesn't matter. It's just arbitrary constants. This is the freedom we have here because whatever this K happens to be or however I set it up, once I put, you know, this piece of information that they've given me in, it's just going to all turn out correct anyway, so it's fine. So this is fine. Let's maybe clean this up a bit. 20 times 1.25 is going to be 25. So this is t to the 1.25 over 25. Slightly nice. Okay, it's all pretty horrible, but it doesn't quite matter. Let's just get some numbers in. So what can we do? It says one of these trees is one meter high when it is first planted. First planted, that's going to be t equals zero, and then h is going to be one. So I'm just going to sub all of this into here. So it's not going to be nice, but it doesn't matter. So 8 ln of 4 minus, well, the square root of 1 is just minus 2, square root of 1, 1 again. So that's just going to stay there. Plus k equals, and then, well, this is t equals 0, actually, isn't it? So this is just going to be 0. So it's not too bad. I need to rearrange for k here, don't I? So k is going to be equal to 2, and then plus 8 ln of 4 minus 1, which is 3. I could put this into my calculator, but I'm not going to. Like, keep things exact if you ever have the chance. At this point, yeah, there's some luns and stuff, but I've not had to touch my calculator. It's still exact. I've not lost any accuracy, and I'm going to be using this later as well. So there's really no point for you to go to your calculator at this point. I'm basically going to wait till right at the end to jump into the calculator. Okay, we're not quite done, are we? We do know what H is in terms of K, but there's still a bit more kind of going on. So, right, this is our formula that relates H and T. We know what K is now as well. And now it says calculate the time that this tree would take to reach a height of 12. So we look to this formula, we're gonna sub H equals 12 in, and then use our value for K that we've just derived, and then the only unknown is going to be t. So it will get a bit messy, but don't worry because it's just subbing numbers in. So minus 8 ln of 4 minus root h, so minus root minus 2 root h, 2 root 12. Plus k, we know what k is now, don't we? 2 plus 8 ln 3. I know it's getting big, but just slow and steady, right? Equals t to the 1.25 over 25. Now, there's a lot going on, but honestly, I'll be able to put all this in my calculator. 
If I times through everything by 25, I'm going to get t to the 1.25 equals 25 times by all of this. The reason I'm doing all of this kind of like this is just because I don't want to do little bits of my calculator and keep getting those rounded out. So 4 minus root 12 minus 2 root 12 plus 2 statement 3. So now, how would I get t? Well, all I would do is I would just kind of do the, the opposite index. So it's going to be the 1.25th root of this, which sounds weird, but it is something you can do in your calculator. You know, if I have t squared, I do the square root. If I have t cubed, I do the cube root. So if I have t to the 1.25, I do like the, the 1.25th root, as it were. It's strange, but it doesn't matter too much. So essentially, I would have this. And then all of this stuff here, it would just be, be in there as well, wouldn't it? So if I just grab this, put it in there, this is exactly what I'm dealing with. So all I now need to do is go straight to the calculator. So be super careful on your kind of syntax here, because I suppose there are a couple of things, you know, you need to make sure all your brackets line up and stuff like that. So essentially what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out this thing inside here, and then I'll just do the 1.25th root of the answer. So if I do 25 and then open my bracket out, I'm going to have minus 8 ln bracket 4 minus the square root of 12 minus 2 root 12 plus 2 plus 8 ln 3. Make sure all of my brackets are closed. That is going to get me 221. 0.279, etc. But remember, I still need to do the 1.25th root. So now all I do is I'm just going to say 1.25th root of answer. Ant. And that is going to get me 75.154. Dot, 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 and then see kind of what accuracy they want. It says calculate the time this tree will take to reach height of 12, giving your answer to three significant figures. So, so three significant figures, that's going to be 75.2. Um, and then T seems to be measured in. Whew, and I believe we are done. Now, I promised I'd talk about AI Tutor a bit at the end. So to avoid talking your head off and going over every feature that it offers, I will, I will leave that when you visit the site. But to give you a bit of an idea of a couple of things it can do, so it works on phones. So I'm just going to grab my phone here and go to AI Tutor and open up my dashboard. So let's say, you know, I really wanted to practice. I've just done my revision for circles or sectors of circles, and I really want to practice some stuff there. I can just go straight to there and any part of the syllabus I want to learn, I can go straight to it and start practicing. So if I just go to syllabus here and then I can see that I've got pure mechanic stats, let's jump to trigonometry. And see here that okay sectors that's what i want to practice working with sectors straight in and i've got questions grouped by difficulty on sectors if i go into one here you can see that i'm going to get a proper exam question all diagrams and everything are there and the best thing about this is that if i go to answer a question i'm going to get a full proper solution there's no messing about with mark schemes with your m1s and a1s and stuff like that we're going to get a human being talking you through exactly how to do each question. And you are going to see that after doing a few of these, your progress is going to shoot up over time. So that's a bit of, you know, that's a small idea of some of the things you can do on AI Tutor. There are many more, but I will leave it to you to go to aitutor.co.uk and fully check it out.